Romans chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest, doest the same thing. Dost the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same? That thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. We'll finish there and pick up from where we left off. Verse 3. We're doing 3 and 4, God willing, today. And thinkest thou this, O man that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance of long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. O man is a reference to an unsaved man. It is an unsaved man looking at another unsaved man and saying, Man, that guy must be going to hell. Look how bad he is. Look at the way he's living. Just look at what he is doing with his life. He's going to go to hell, he is. Man judging another. The unsaved judging the unsaved. Paul's answer to that is that the fellow who says that is doing the same things to earn the same judgment of God. The fellow who says that is doing the same things to earn the same judgment of God. The difference between the unsaved man and the Christian here is that the Christian knows that he is guilty and that he deserves hell as much as anyone. But what we have done is we have gone to the Saviour And we have sought his mercy and forgiveness. He took our sins. He took our punishment. He took our judgment. That's the Christian. That's what we are looking at. He has done all of that for us. We know we're as guilty as the unsaved man. We know that we deserve hell. I sure know that. I deserve to go to hell for my sins. I've gone to the Saviour and asked him to forgive me. And he has done. I go to heaven not on the base of what I have done, but what he has done. I've trusted him. It's the atonement. I am made one with God because of Jesus Christ. The unsaved man doesn't understand that and he thinks that we think we are better than them better than the unsaved man because we say that we're going to heaven and they're going to hell so they think we are better than them but that's not it we are worse than them in that respect because we need a saviour they think they don't we need the saviour I can't get to heaven on my own Not of works, lest any man should boast. I can't work or earn my salvation. The reason I'm going to heaven is because of Jesus Christ and him alone. Nothing that I have done to earn my salvation. I cannot work for it. But the unsaved man doesn't understand that. 
and he thinks that we think we're better than he is. But that's not what we're saying. We're saying we're such vile, hell-deserving sinners that we need the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins, to wash us in his precious blood, and we trust in him for our sins forgiven. You die in your sins or you die with your sins forgiven. Simple. No sitting on the fence. Crystal clear. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? It's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the practice of claiming to have higher standards, higher beliefs, than is the case. One who feigns, F-E-I-G-N-S, one who feigns, which means pretends, gives a false Appearance, one who feigns to be what he is not. That's what a hypocrite is. One who feigns. One who pretends to be what he is not. Gives a false appearance. Let me give you a couple of verses. 2 Timothy 3 5. 2 Timothy. 3, verse 5 Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away What a great verse that is, fits in perfect Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away You look at the Church of England today having a form of godliness You look at different denominations, having a form of godliness, all the different churches we've been to, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Hypocritical, they're hypocrites. It's apostasy. We said before, apostasy is one of the greatest signs that we are seeing today, showing that the Lord Jesus Christ could come any time. It precedes the rapture. And you'll find this, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof, from such turn away, where do you find this? 2 Timothy 3, which talks about this no also in the last days. So, there is hypocrisy and apostasy in the church in the last days. Every dispensation ends in failure, ends in apostasy. We're seeing it today. Hypocrisy everywhere. Make sure you're not a hypocrite. Make sure you're living as you should be. Make sure your relationship is right with Jesus Christ. All of us, take it personal this morning, this evening, wherever you're listening to this CD. Matthew 6 verse 5 And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are who speak in Jesus Christ. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men very I say unto you, they have their reward. Hypocrisy. You know what? I've been to prayer meetings years and years and years, for years I've seen this, where people stand to pray and they're not praying, they're preaching. Did you get that? I've seen people that want to be seen of men. So when everybody is sitting and praying, they have to get up kneel and face the congregation. To be seen of men, having a form of godliness, hypocrisy, trying to prove that you are something when you are nothing. Covering your sins because you're not living right. Matthew 15 Matthew 15, make sure you're not a hypocrite. Verse 7 to 11. Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, you can say the right things, you can do the right things, you can look right, but you're still a hypocrite. You can act as if everything is normal and perfect, 
but your heart is still far from God. Are you like that? You're saying the right things, you're doing the right things, you're wearing the right things, you're acting like everything is okay, yet your heart is far from God. Are you like that? Now we're talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What is your personal relationship like with him? You see, you can, you're such a good actor and I'm such a good actor that we can con each other thinking that everything is okay when it isn't. Hypocrisy. Backsliding. Is that you today? This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth This defileth a man. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out, because what comes out is from the heart. What's your conversation like? What's your attitude like? What are your motives like? What are you feeding on? Television, radio, media, newspapers. What are you feeding on? Or the Word of God. What do you talk about? We said this morning, what do you talk about before the church service begins the Lord worldly things or do you sit reading your Bible do you sit in communication in prayer with God you're communing with God what are you doing before the church service starts is your heart prepared for what God wants to give you through his word you're going to break bread is your heart and life right This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's a very, very powerful scripture. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, verse 1 to 4. We said this is an incredible passage again. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, and therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. That's a hypocrite. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. That's the Lord speaking. They're laying these heavy burdens upon their hearers and they won't do anything because they're such hypocrites. They won't do anything to alleviate the burdens. They won't help them. They say one thing and do another. They say you should live like this but they're not living like this. They're hypocrites. Verse 13 to 15. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Anybody pray long in your church service? Why don't you pray long outside of the church service in your own closet? Make long prayer. What, you want to show off? Keep your prayers short and to the point when you're in public and pray as long as you like when you're on your own. Because you don't have to try and impress anybody then. God knows your heart. Don't impress people by your long prayers. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ spoke those words. The child of hell. Verse 23 to 29. 
Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and come in and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. That's like Bible correctors. That's exactly what they're like. Straining at a gnat. Something they don't understand. Straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. They're blind guides. And you don't want to follow any of them. Not whitey whitewash, not any of them. Not the Bible correctors anywhere. Anybody says there's an error in that book, don't follow them. They want to eat gnats for the rest of their life, let them have them. Swallow camels, let them have them. All they want. All it does is give them the ump. (laughs) Okay, forget it. You blind guys which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You make the outside look good, but inside full of dead man's bones. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, this is Jesus Christ speaking, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Don't you think these are really hard-hitting verses spoken of by the gentle and meek Lord Jesus Christ? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites! He won't let go, will he? Because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He spoke those words. He was a man, perfect man, without sin, Perfect God, without sin. He is God in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. That's who Jesus Christ is. So, Romans 2 verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Be careful who you judge. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a backslider. Live as God wants you to live, holy and pure lives. Romans 2 verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now, all the dealings of God toward men are to get him to repent. That's what God wants him to do, to repent of his sins and follow the Lord. God certainly shows his goodness towards unsaved men. Look at Matthew 5. Matthew 5 verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. He certainly shows his goodness towards unsaved men. Acts 14. Acts 14, verse 16 and 17. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. 
the unsaved eat the food that God provides. They live in a world that God has provided the air, the sunshine, the water, clothing, a body that works, a digestive system that can eat, feelings of love and friendship. God has given them all these things, all your senses. You can walk, you can talk, you can feel, you can smell, you can hear. All these things God has given the unsaved man. But does he thank God? No. All the dealings of God toward man are to get him to repent. God certainly has shown his goodness towards unsaved men. So God has always shown his goodness to the unsaved heathen by the common blessings he gives to all mankind. But in the context here, the goodness of God in his forbearance, i.e. he doesn't always punish an unsaved man as he could. He doesn't always punish an unsaved man as he could. His forbearance. His long-suffering, i.e. he puts up with the sinner. God has always shown his goodness to the unsaved heathen by the common blessings he has given to all mankind. But here in the context, the goodness of God in his forbearance, i.e. he doesn't always punish an unsaved man as he could, isn't that true? He could drop them dead as the moment they step out of line, but he doesn't. He lets them carry on. His forbearance. His long-suffering. He puts up with the sinner. He continually shows his love and his mercy. Forbearance occurs twice in scripture. Romans 2, 4 and Romans 3, verse 25. It means this. Forbearance patient, self-control, long-suffering, a ceasing or restraining from action. That's the forbearance of God. He is patient, he has self-control, he is long-suffering, he ceases and restrains from his action because he loves them so much and he wants them to repent. bit different from your evil doctrine of Calvinism, isn't it? Elect to damnation. Not much of a loving God without giving them a chance, is it? Long-suffering occurs in 17 verses. And it means long-endurance. Bearing problems or provocation. And provocation means the action of provoking. Long endurance. Bearing problems of provocation with patience. Bearing problems or provocation, the action of provoking with patience. He's long suffering. Exodus 34, verse 6. Exodus 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That's the God we serve. God doesn't unleash the wrath which he could upon a sinner. And he puts up with the sinner's foolishness in order that the sinner will realise just how good God has been to him and therefore repent 
and make things right with God. God is not, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He's not willing that any should perish. A bit different from your evil Calvinistic doctrine, isn't it? God wants you to repent. God wants you to walk with him. He wants you to love him. He knows what is best for you. Just do as he says. But this is not the way God treats the Christian. The Lord will let a Christian suffer oftentimes. Why? I'm going to give you a few points here. Number one. To make him heavenly minded. God will let the Christian suffer to make him heavenly minded. 1 Peter 1, I want to read a passage here, verse 1 to 16. 1 Peter 1, verse 1 to 16. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Asia and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge, they are, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit and unto, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You have an inheritance in heaven awaiting you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, in, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You may be going through a real hard time at the moment. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's what we are waiting for now. The appearing of Jesus Christ. We're waiting for him to come back. Whom having not seen, I've never seen Jesus Christ, Ye love, I love him, even though I've not seen him. I love that verse. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, I certainly do, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of, this, of the grace that should come unto you. They never saw, they weren't given the promises that we were, they never saw what we did. That we see, what we see now. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That's his first coming and his second coming, all in one there. The sufferings of Christ, his first coming, the glory that should follow, his second coming. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us. They did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The angels want to know what it's all about in that sense, in regard to your relationship with Jesus Christ. They haven't got the relationship with the Lord Jesus that you have. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end of the grace and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being revealed. The revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Not fashioning yourselves according to the world. You're not to fashion yourselves according to the world. You're not to go back to your old, old ways or the, the things that you used to do. You've left those behind. You're not a dog returning to its vomit. 
You are a new creature in Christ. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So we are going through this time of tribulation, trial, the trials of our faith, heaviness, manifold temptations, problems, sickness, disease. We're going through all these things. And it's to keep our minds focused that heaven is just around the corner. Let's be heavenly minded. Not fashioning ourselves according to this world. Get your eyes off the world, folks, and get them on the Lord Jesus Christ. Job 23. Job 23, verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me. I shall come forth as gold. He knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me. I shall come forth as gold. We need to be tried. We need to be purified. We need to let God fashion us as he sees fit. We need to be broken and moulded and chipped away at. It's not pleasant, it doesn't feel nice and it's hard at times, but God knows what he's doing. Psalm 66, verse 10. For thou, O God, hast proved us Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Gold is tried, silver is tried. The Christian life is tried. Proverbs 17, Proverbs 17 verse 3. The fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. What's your heart like? Your motives, your actions. How do you treat the Lord? How do you treat other people? How are you living for the Lord? It's all very well saying that you're a Christian, that you live for the Lord, but do you really? Making out that you're living right, yet you're stubborn, you won't change, is that really living for the Lord? You don't want the Lord to correct you, you can't control your mouth, your actions, you expect everybody to come to you because you think you are it, is that living for the Lord? Isaiah 48, verse 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. The furnace of affliction. We have to go, we have to be afflicted at times. But God delivers us, helps us, guides us through. We all have to go through bad things. It's all part of life. You don't become a Christian to escape the bad things. You're mad if that's why you become a Christian. You're going to go through the refining pot of the Lord. That's tough. But what's ahead of you, keep your mind fixed on heaven because we've, we're going to get it so good soon. Just go through this, you know, this brief moment in our lives. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, 18. What great verses. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that's what we're going through now, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we're going through this light affliction. That does seem like we're going through it and through it and through it, and you feel like, it's never ending. But God says, compare that to eternity. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. You know, again I speak only from what I experience, but the pain that I am living in, yeah, you live in constant pain, you walk and it's painful, and uh, it does keep your mind focused on the Lord, and when that pain is alleviated for just a little part of your life, like yesterday we went for a walk, and um, I've been sitting down for quite a while, and then I get up and I start walking. I must have walked, I don't know, 50 paces or something without pain. I couldn't believe it. I thought, this is fantastic. Then it kicks in again. You know, there's something going wrong on your hip or you know, whatever it is with yourselves. And then you're back to it, but you start thinking again about the Lord and you talk to the Lord. When you're in pain, you talk to the Lord. When you go through trials and tribulations, you talk to the Lord. When something's going wrong in your life, you talk to... We should be talking to the Lord all the time, but it keeps you focused. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's eternal things that are important. You need to keep focused on heaven. The second one is, why do we suffer as Christians? To prove to the Christian, to prove to us, that his promises are sure. 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. No no's there about the promises. God promises, it's going to be yea. It's going to come to fulfilment. 2 Peter 1 4. God's going to take you to heaven. He's promised to do it. You're going to go to heaven. He's promised to save you because you've trusted in Jesus Christ for your sins forgiven. You're in heaven right now, just waiting for your body to be changed, calling up at the rapture, and all will be well. 2 Peter 1 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Number three, to make a Christian sympathetic with other people. If you're going through something, every time I see a guy limp now, I'm sympathetic towards him because I limp. I understand. I'm, I feel what he's going through. I couldn't empathise before, but I, perhaps I could sympathise, but I empathise now because I'm in this situation. 1 Peter 5 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Listen, I'm going through the same things that a lot of other people are going through, and so are you, in your life. You've just gone through university, had four years of university, you now know what it's like to go through university, and you can help and encourage other people, hence why your article has been a blessing to so many people out there. And it's, it's the same thing, whatever we're going through in life, You've got rheumatoid arthritis, you can sympathise and empathise now with other people that have it. You know, what we go through, all our brethren all over the world, scattered throughout the world, are still going through trials and tribulations and problems, whether they're in you know, Afghanistan or India or America or Australia, wherever, wherever they are around the world, Hong Kong, wherever they are, they're going through the same problems that you and I are going through. We take comfort in that, that we're not the only ones. God's dealing with us all. It's a refining fire. And soon, God's going to call us home and everything will be well. Peak fitness, <laughs> peak health. In heaven, 100% perfect. What a wonderful hope that is. And God promises. And what God promises comes to fulfilment. 1 Peter 2.21 For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Christ is our example, and you should also be an example to others who are around you. You should be a great testimony to your family, to your sisters, to your brothers. You should take a stand when everybody else isn't taking a stand, so people look up to you and think, yes, they're really trying to live for the Lord Jesus. Oh, they won't get involved with that because they're Christians. They won't drink, take drugs, they won't socialise in these bad places, they won't go to all these bad places, because they're Christians. It's a good testimony. And if your family are looking at that, that's a great testimony. Because most families, you know, who aren't Bible believers or backsliders, whatever, they look to that one and they're challenged by your life. True? It's true. So be the best witness you possibly can. So to make a Christian sympathetic with other people, you can sympathise, but if you're going through the same kind of thing they're going through, you can empathise. And that's the same with even reaching people in the world. If you're going through the same problems with people in the world, you can sympathise, empathise with them and talk to them about the Lord. A great opportunity for witnessing. Remember the guy down south who was in the wheelchair? They used to go into the hospitals all the time because he was, you know, he's terminally ill. He's going to the hospital and every time he's in there, He's seeing other people that are in the same situation because he's in the ward for whatever illness he has and he is witnessing and testifying to them about Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm going through the same thing that you are going through but my hope and faith is in Jesus Christ. 
Then when he has to go for the MRI scans or the other scans, they put the CD on, he puts the CD on of the sermons, and now the nurses are listening to the sermons. He's got a great testimony. Remember all those leaflets he took off us and he pins up in, all around the hospitals, they were allowed to do that? He, he was allowed to do that? He's a great testimony. Number four, are we? To allow that Christian to be in a place where he can experience the power of the Holy Spirit. So God wants to do something through your life. He may allow something to happen to you. So you can experience and understand more of God through his Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I laboured more abundantly than they all, yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. God carries you through by his grace. You've got to go through times where you think, I can't do this, and God carries you through. So you can experience the power of God in your life. Romans 8 verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit... Do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You've got to kill the flesh, the fleshly desires, your motives through this this flesh. You've got to kill it, mortify it through the Spirit of God. Let God slay what you can't. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit will help you pray. There will be times when you will be inspired to do something through the Spirit of God. You walk with God. On the basis of that verse, I've heard that so taken out of context by the charismatics and the tongue speakers, it does make me smile. We should pray for as we ought. Uh, we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. They say, "Well, it's the Spirit that takes over and gives you that heavenly language," <laughs> and then uh, it goes on to say, "The groanings which cannot be uttered. You can't speak it." <laughs> they don't get that, but we'll leave that for another time. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 4. 1 Corinthians 2 4, nearly through. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So God allows you to go through certain things so that He can get the glory in your life. And so you don't know when God is like using you at times. My, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. You're not winning somebody over with your wisdom, with the wisdom of man, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You can say a th- few words through the power of the Holy Spirit and can convict somebody straight away, straight to the heart, and they can become a Christian. Just those few words. The Word of God, watered by the Spirit of God, given the increase by God. Number five, the Lord will let a Christian suffer because he wants to teach the Christian patience. We want things instant, God wants us to be patient in certain things. Romans 5, verse 3 to 5, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Romans 5, 3 to 5. James 1, verse 3. James 1, verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Number 6. The Lord will let the Christian suffer to prove his grace is sufficient. Paul knew all about this, didn't he? In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, 
lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians 3.5 Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as, a, as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So he's proven his grace is sufficient for us. So the Lord will allow a Christian to suffer for different reasons. There's a few reasons as we've just quoted. An unsaved man only suffers for one reason, to wake him up and show him his need of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, because God doesn't want them to go to hell. So the Christian suffers in many ways different to the unsaved man. The unsaved man may suffer because he wants to wake him up. God wants to wake him up and trust in him for his sins forgiven. Trust in the Lord for his sins forgiven and save him because God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And he gives us all a chance. Every single man on earth. Christ tasted death for every man. Quite different to the evil doctrine of Calvinism. Don't you think? So that's Romans chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. We'll pick up from verse 5 next week. Let us pray.